of Citrix for beginners, how to set up a Citrix environment. And I think it's really critical before we go into the implementation stage and start the installation is to really just understand the workflow and how the different components communicate with each other and how users will actually authenticate into the Citrix environment. So for ease of simplicity in this video, I will only go through ZenApps and Desktop 7.x, so no legacy type stuff. Um, and we'll also go through both the scenario of a user connecting internally directly through storefront, as well as when we bring into Netscaler in the mix. So you'll see me looking down a lot. That's just because I'm whiteboarding on my Surface tablet. So I apologize in advance if I'm not looking up enough. Uh, but hopefully this video will help you get that better understanding of, of your Citrix environment. So first thing first, with any environment, we have our user. And our user, in this case, doesn't have an attached neck. But what they do have is they have something called a Citrix receiver client that lives on their endpoint device. Which, by the way, one, one of the major benefits of Citrix is the endpoint's pretty agnostic. We can utilize a Mac, a thin client, a zero client, a Windows device, a mobile device, you name it. We just need to have that receiver client that lives on it, um, unless we're doing HTML5, which that's a whole other discussion. So the first thing a user is gonna typically do is a user is going to authenticate first. So you'll see that's number step one on, on the top there. So once a user authenticates, they're gonna forward those credentials over to what I like to call our storefront server. And the way I like to explain a storefront server is it's our portal that we're interacting with where we see all of our virtual applications and desktops. So this will literally be the, the page a user will see either on their receiver client or on their receiver for web um, client. So that would be from a browser. And once the storefront gets those credentials, of course, storefront's gonna need to send those credentials over to Active Directory to, to make sure the authentication is correct, which by the way, that's over 389. And then the storefront connection is typically gonna be over 443. Active Directory will give a response to storefront saying, hey, we're good to go, or no, we're not good to go, let's reject the user. If everything's good to go, storefront's gonna then reach out to our delivery controller, which is essentially our broker server within the environment. And I'll, I'll touch upon that more. It also is responsible for the XML service. And this will actually happen over XML, which I believe is 80, 80, or that does not look like an eight, that's okay, or 443. In which case, the delivery controller is also gonna to respond to the Active Directory server for a verification process. Essentially what it's doing is it's getting the security groups that that user belongs to because we'll need that information to decide what resources to display to the user. So what actual applications and desktops they'll see on their, their storefront portal. Once the delivery controller gets that information, it's gonna query SQL because SQL has everything about the Citrix environment living in it. This is where we have our, our Citrix databases stored. So it'll go in and say, hey, Ryan has, has a group called manager. What resources do I display to, to Ryan? SQL will respond back. The delivery controller will um, send over an XML request to the storefront server. The storefront server will start enumerating those applications, which by the way, before this even happened, uh, I guess I should have noted, storefront's already enumerating the subscriptions for the applications, which are your favorites. So those are all stored locally on the storefront server in a, a text file. So it's already starting this enumeration process, but it needed that information from the delivery controller to display everything to the user. So storefront is doing that enumeration, and now the user should see all of their applications and desktops that are available to them. So in this case, we've already done the authentication, we've done the enumeration, and now the user is ready to do the launch. So now a user can see all of their resources, they see their applications, they see their virtual desktops. So let's say they go ahead and click an application. So before 
we do that, let's say we have three application servers. So these can be app server, or they could even be our, our a VDI, depending on how we had this set up. But let's just say these are the other two are app servers. And let's say the user launches PowerPoint. And we know on this app server, we have PowerPoint here, but on this one, we have Word, and this one's gonna be our VDI. So that's gonna be our, our virtual desktop. I'll take that and write that there. And again, apologize for the terrible handwriting. So the first thing that we're gonna look for first is, well, does the application server have PowerPoint living on it? Yes, okay, that's a contender, no, and we're not doing a virtual desktop, so no. But let's say there's two, let's say there's another one and this one had PowerPoint also. Well now, how are we gonna decide which application server in the back end to send the user to? It's pretty straightforward. It does a load evaluator process. So it's essentially load balancing based on user load. So if we have, let's say 100 users on this, this top server here, so let's say we have 100 here, but only 50 here. This is probably going to be our, our contender right here because it has the least load. And that's really weird. It's showing up as, as black, even though I use a highlighter, but that's okay. So user launches it. The delivery controller decides, hey, I'm going to send user to application server four. It's going to send that information back over to storefront. Storefront's going to generate something called an ICA file, which will be pushed back down to the actual client. And Citrix receiver will then launch the ICA file. So that's really the number one reason we have receiver living on the client is that it's necessary to launch that file type. So the way I like to explain this is think of from a PDF perspective, how we need something like Adobe Reader or Acrobat Reader to launch a .pdf file, we need receiver to launch that ICA file. Once receiver launches that ICA file, a direct connection between the user and the application server will be created over either 1494 or 2598 if session reliability is enabled and there will be a direct connection from the client from the user to that backend application server which is great for us because in the case of let's say something goes down there's a lot of policies we can put in place to ensure that connection renames remains running and idle so if i relaunch that powerpoint application it'll just reuse that connection because that's what takes the, the most amount of time during a citrix logon process is establishing that ica connection All right, so let's take a look at what the whiteboard would look like when we incorporate a Netscaler into the Citrix environment. And by the way, just by introducing a Netscaler into the environment, we provide a whole slew of functionalities. Things like a remote access gateway, so users can connect remotely when they're off the network without having to VPN in. Of course, there's load balancing capabilities, so we have that high availability for our storefront servers, as well as other servers within our environment. Um, we have TCP optimization capabilities, SSL offload to really just improve overall performance for those HTTPS connections. So a lot of capabilities right off the bat that, that we're incorporating by introducing a Netscaler. So let's take a look at the whiteboard. And just like before, we always start with our user, right? So we gonna have a user, and again, the user's gonna have a receiver client that lives on their device, regardless of what the device is. And let's say in this case, we have a user named Bob, and Bob went home for the day. He decided, hey, I wanna do a half day. I'm gonna work from Starbucks. So what he's gonna do, he's going to open up our browser once he's in Starbucks, and has his, his latte or cappuccino in hand, and he's gonna type in company name.citrix.com, where he's gonna be connecting to his Netscaler. So you'll see here I have my Netscaler, which is gonna be located in my organization's DMZ. And Bob, what he's gonna see now is he's gonna see his company's logo there. 
and he's also going to see a username and password prompt. And if his organization is fantastic, he might even see a one-time password prompt for multi-factor authentication. So he needs to actually type in his credentials. Once he types in those credentials and send those over to the Netscaler, Netscaler is gonna verify those with Active Directory. And just like before, Active Directory will say, hey, yeah, let's let him in. No, let's reject Bob. He typed his password or username incorrectly and let's give him that error message. But let's say everything worked as expected. What we're gonna do here is Netscaler is going to pass those credentials through the storefront. If pass-through authentication to Netscaler is configured, um, it'll pass this through. Otherwise, storefront will prompt again for username and password in that same workflow of the last video or the last whiteboard um, will occur, the same exact thing. Also, there's something called a callback URL. If that's configured, storefront will reach back out to Netscaler and do a callback. Um, to verify those credentials again. So that's the authentication. If all is well, then Bob here at Starbucks is going to be logged into Storefront. Um, of course, what he's also going to do, or what Citrix will also do, is it's going to reach out to the delivery controller. The delivery controller is going to query AD for those security groups, just like last time. Let's say Bob is in sales and Bob has certain access to applications that somebody from say HR or engineering do, do not have in which case to identify what those applications are the delivery controller is going to query SQL for that information so SQL will say hey yeah let's provide Bob with Salesforce his office applications um, his browser whatever the case may be uh, the delivery controller is going to send an XML over to Storefront and Storefront will begin that enumeration process of those applications and potentially virtual desktops again. So that's going to be the, the enumeration piece there. Now we're on the launching phase, right? So Bob is connected to Storefront. He sees all of his applications and desktops available to him, and he wants to select one of those applications. So let's say he wants to launch PowerPoint just like before, because he has to work on a deck for, for one of his customers, and we have two app servers. App one, app two, this one has PowerPoint. This one has Word and it doesn't have PowerPoint on it. And this has an IP of let's say dot eleven. This one has an IP of dot twelve. What's gonna happen now is as a part of the delivery controller, we have something called an STA service that's running on this. So maybe write that here. So we have something called STA. And essentially what this is doing is it's gonna be generating a ticket. So within that ticket, we're going to have things like a ticket number, we're going to have the IP address of all of these application servers. Specifically, it's going to put the IP of the one we want to connect Bob to listed here. So let's say we'll have the IP of, of dot .11. And it has some other information as well, but these are what what's important for, to us for now. And what the delivery controller is going to do it's going to send over that ticket to the storefront server and the storefront server is going to generate that ICA file with that ticket what's a little unique is even though storefront's getting that ticket from the delivery controller it's only getting a part of that ticket it's not getting the entire ticket so the IP address that we see here isn't going to be utilized within that that generated ICA file. So while Storefront sends that back over to Netscaler, so it's going to go back to Netscaler, and then Netscaler is going to send over that that ICA attachment over to the client, so a receiver can launch that. That client, that ICA file that the client's launching, won't have information about those private IP addresses that are that we're connecting to in the back end. And by the way, this is this connection to Netscaler, I should have mentioned this before. This is over 443. It's always gonna be encrypted connection and Netscaler by default is a secure device. So once receiver connects or receiver launches that ICA file, what's gonna happen that's a little different now than what was before is rather than 
the client creating that ICA communication directly to that backend application server, the Netscaler is going to be responsible for establishing that connection. So this is going to be your ICA connection and Netscaler, you're going to have always a 443 connection to Netscaler, but the ICA connection is going to go from the Netscaler to the application server. And then your channel is, is established, right? So that's your launching portion of this. So as you can see, um, from a security standpoint, it just makes a lot of sense to introduce a Netscaler. We're keeping all of our private IPs private and we're proxying that connection through a very secure appliance that has things like web application firewall, DDoS protection, SQL injection protection, you, you name it. And not only that, but what isn't so apparent here is Netscaler also has other capabilities as I mentioned earlier. So if we had, let's say in the case of the environment, we're gonna build out two storefront servers. Well, the Netscaler can decide exactly how to send users to those various storefront servers. So we might look at things like the least connection. So I want to send users to a storefront server that has the least number of load. And of course, I want to send users to a storefront server that's fully up and functional. So one of the capabilities of a Netscaler is it can actually monitor the services that are running on that storefront server and identify if they're up or down. So if the authentication service goes down on storefront, we can ensure that we send users directly to the storefront server that has that authentication service fully functional. So it has built-in monitoring specific to Citrix services, which is really great from a, from a redundancy standpoint. So hope this helped, hope this gave everybody um, kind of a high level overview of how the workflow and how the communication works. And I completely realize that I'm covering over that ticket with my picture, so sorry about that. Uh, but in the next video, we'll actually begin walking through the implementation of the Citrix environment. We'll start with the delivery controller first. So again, if anybody has any questions, comments, Feel free to write in the comment box below. I'll try to help as, as much as I can. Thank, thanks, guys.